folks joining us, let us know where you're come, calling in from. We're going to start out Meet the Miniaturist interview in a second, just to let everybody know the chat box will be open for questions throughout the interview. So please feel free to ask your questions. We'll be monitoring the chat box and we'll be trying to get to as many of the questions as we can. So definitely let us know what your questions are. Same on Facebook. We'll be going back and answering any questions you might have on Facebook as well. So please don't hesitate to ask away. It's great to see all of you. Welcome to everyone. Special, special guest today is Kay Browning, who has the KSB Miniatures Collection in Maysville, Kentucky. This has been on my bucket list forever, and I will get there eventually, but we're so great, so thrilled to have Kay here to give us some of it, at least via the Zoom, Zoominar, and tell us about the collection to learn also to learn more about Kay herself, about how she got into, into miniature collecting and, and just to hear about her awesome, awesome collection. So thank you Kay for joining us. We're so happy you're here and let's get right to it. I mean, this is just, I mean, your collection is probably one of the most extensive and exquisite collections on the planet. Thank and it's you. all housed in Maysville, Kentucky, where you're from. So tell us a little bit about the space that it's in. Tell us about Maysville. Tell us a little bit about the museum. Well, Maysville is a wonderful river town. It's on the Ohio River. <clears throat> and uh, what, what we, we loved to do is share our history with everyone. And so what better way to do it than in miniature? And so that's basically how uh, there was a 1882 building right. that uh, was originally there. And my husband, bless his heart, was instrumental in getting that restarted back in, in uh, 1976. So right. um, it's, it's, it's just a wonderful way uh, to teach history. Yeah, so, so definitely a focus on history. But where did it begin for you and your love of miniatures? It, it really started when I went to visit a friend of mine who had a dollhouse that had been made by her grandfather. Right. And, you know, I had one of the metal, you know, the metal with the plastic furniture in it and that it was okay, but it really didn't do much for me. I, I was more of a, uh, you know, play, uh, dress up, play with dolls and, and, you know, with 18 inch dolls. So um, going to her home and seeing her dollhouse with real lights and curtains. And I'm thinking, gosh, this, you know, this is really, this really is a dollhouse. Right. So um, that basically was how I got started. But, you know, when I was 27 and I'd had my two little girls, I was reading a book and many, many people have heard this story, but I was reading a Tasha Tudor book to my girls. And on the Q page was, it was A, a, a is for Annabelle. And it was an alphabet book. And on the Q page, it was a Q is the quilt on grandmother's bed. And honestly, when I saw that, that was, that was the beginning of my passion. Right. It was exactly like a bed I had slept in as a child, and it had the exact pink and white nine square quilt on it that my grandmother had made for my doll bed. So luckily, uh, my former husband was, he was handy with the, with the wood, woodworking, and he bought a Dremel mini lathe, and he cut, he cut an old walnut gun butt into strips, and he turned that on the mini lathe for me. And, you know, I didn't realize it at the time, but the book itself, the page, that bed was exactly 112 scale. Now, I, I didn't know anything about scale. Right. And he made it, he drew, he drew out the pattern exactly from the bed that was in that book and made it. And that was, boy, that's when it took off. So he handcrafted this 12 scale miniature that in, was inspired by this the cue in this book that you had read. And that was that the first yes. sort of, would we say that was your first fine scale miniature? That was my first fine scale miniature. And do you know, my, my philosophy has not changed at all in my collecting. Okay. That piece was, that piece was just as fine as any other piece I have today. Uh -huh. Where is and it today? I went, on to, I went on to buy two other chairs, uh, cane back chairs. And so that, that was the beginning. So he was a miniaturist. He made, he made other things? No, he was not a miniaturist. He actually had planned to be a dentist. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, well, I mean, work with that it was sort of right up his line, but, but that, you know, that didn't come to pass. So, right. so that was it. But that sort of started it. 
and and started your passion. But and and, and you start collecting from there. Like, what was the next thing that you did? Well, the next thing that I did, um, I had a, I had misplaced a piece, and I heard about a miniature show in Cincinnati, Ohio, and I thought, well, I'll just go and see if I can find a piece to replace that chair with. And so I went and I, I was totally shocked. I mean, at that time, the Cincinnati show had about 180 vendors. I mean, it was, it was, you know, it was one table backed up to the next. And, yeah. and I think as, as I will tell new collectors starting out, I only had so many resources and I, I went through the show looking for that very, very special piece. And I left the show with one piece. Okay. And it was, a, it was a, a, a double Windsor settee by Joe Ryan. And it was, uh -huh. it was just, it was really special. Right, wow. And so that was your first big show. Yes. And, and you were just blown away by the, the sheer number of tables and the number of artisans. Right. And at this point, you're really still collecting. You're just, you're acquiring at this point. Yes. And, and when, did you, when did you find this space to house this collection that you had amassed? Uh, that's a funny story. <laughs> I'm doing a fast forward here. But <laughs> you went from shopping well, to Cincinnati to a I, I had, museum. <laughs> I, had, uh, I had five houses in one room, and we had moved our piano out of what was called the music room. And... So I, I actually started out with, with five houses and furnished all of them. And I would, I would put on small tours because I really wanted to share it with people. Right. But then that room grew into another room and that room grew into another room. And when I started moving furniture out, especially of my husband's favorite room, he said, this is it. We have to, we have to find something to do. Wow. And luckily he was involved with the museum and he said, let's, you know, let's see what we can do about, about putting them down, you know, at the Kentucky Gateway Museum Center. Right. So explain that. So there's an association, your collection is housed at the, at, at the Kentucky Museum. Yes. So, and, and so what year did that start? Uh, the collection actually went to the museum in 2007. We had our soft opening in November of 2007. And uh, about that time, I, I would say we had about 40% of the collection in the gallery that, that you see there. Right. And between November of 2007 and April of 2008, which we decided to uh, do the, the full scale opening around the Chicago show that, so that people coming from all over the world for the show would be able to come on down and, and partake of the, the celebration. Right, that makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. So, so you only had forty percent of what's there now. Right. And now you're at literally like three, four thousand square feet filled. We've got thirty five hundred square feet in this particular gallery, and then we we um, on occasion open a changing exhibit gallery with another two thousand square feet. Right. So total, we have fifty five hundred. And so, how often do you rotate in and out collections? Is it is there a de definitive time or is it as you have we, new ideas? We have maintenance four times a year and we rotate things in and out. We have some exhibits that, you know, as you see the big, the big structures and the houses and some of the vignettes and the walls stay, they're permanent. And then we have several cases that are changed in and out, especially for seasonal, seasonal, you know, Christmas and Halloween and, and all the fun all the fun holidays. Right. Awesome. Awesome. Well, you talked a little bit about the, the focus on the history and mm -hmm. one of the main pieces is this is beautiful. This is the Cox building. Tell us a little bit about this structure, how this came about. Was this one of the first pieces that went into the museum? This is one of the first pieces that went, it was, it was there when we opened, when we had the soft opening. Um, actually the pharmacy part had not been finished, but um, so Ashby and Jed uh, were commissioned to make this building back in 2004 or five. And it, it, it was the culmination of my childhood, basically. I, I look at that building and I live three doors up from that building. So the drugstore itself was, it was my comic book 
um, shelf and it and Dr. Kilgus uh, would not allow us to come in with our roller skates on so you, my roller skates are there on the front porch wow. um, and you know it was the center of social life we we went there for lunch every day from school and we all congregated there after school and had the old-fashioned nabs and coke and you know it it but the whole downtown was my playground and the Cox building basically is the centerpiece. Right. Um, if you look at the building, uh, the windows, excuse me, over, over my left shoulder there, that was where I had my 17 years of piano lessons. Oh. And uh, so it, that's a, a really special space. And then Mr. Austin, he was the town tailor. He would, he would sit in the window, that corner window that's curved and he would he would straddle the the windowsill and he would work on the garments you know the pants and the and the men's jackets right. but now today that um that that second story where i had my piano lessons is the downing performing arts academy so we we are quite a cultural city I, yeah i mean i think it's just amazing that you're you're you know there's so much involved here you're preserving history you're also sharing your passion you're com you know you're commissioning artists to work on these beautiful pieces i mean it's just it's it just works all the way around for everybody for the good right. of everybody. i mean it's just wonderful and, and one of the other reasons was because the building was so dilapidated that we were afraid we were going to lose it right and every time ashby and jed came to town to measure, they would they would tell the mayor would come to see what was going on, and they would say to the mayor, "You're going to lose this building if you don't, you know, do something." So, it was the catalyst really for the refurbishing and renovation of of that building. Well, you and I, I have another story to tell about that. Yeah, you were you were talking about this before when we were chatting. What what yes. was the, yeah? Tell us that story. What what was so special? Um, when when the building went in of course everybody who who had lived in maysville and had run around you know it brought back such wonderful memories so when the city got hold of the building they decided they would refurbish it and with a, about a month out before they were to have the grand opening the top floor caught on fire and it burned it burned the top two stories completely out so it, you know, it was a question of, is it going to be bulldozed or is it, you know, is, is there going to be money to put it back together? And they did find grant money, grant money. And so the people from the Kentucky Historical Preservation Society from Frankfurt brought their architect over because they had no plans from the, when the building was originally built. So the only way they could reconstruct the roof line was for us to open the case and they measured all the roof lines so that they could put it back. They were gonna to have to just put a flat flat tar roof on it. And so through that miniature, they were able to rebuild that roof and we got our building back. That's it's awesome. just phenomenal. That's, that's so wonderful, that's so good. Is everything in that building furnished? I see that the, the second floor and third are dark. Is there anything behind that? There's, there's nothing in the miniature. Uh, this building was built as a Masonic temple. Okay. And the second floor, uh, as I said, it houses the Performing Arts Academy, and, and we actually had a Culinary Art Institute downstairs. But the top, the top three floors were the Masonic Temple, wow. and so they basically, when they put the building back together, they did not rebuild those two floors. But we, we don't have anything in there. Um, it, you know, it's it's dark glass so that it it the the drugstore can shine. Awesome. Awesome. I don't know if this is part of the Cox building. I had plopped no. this. This is the Russell Theater, which when I talk about the downtown being my playground, I lived across the street from the Russell Theater, three doors up from the Cox building. So, you, you know, it, we, it made a circle. And of course, back then you could go to the movie for 10 cents. Right. But what's special about this, this is another Ashby and Jed piece. And the tiles around the ticket booth are actually replicas of Rookwood, the Rookwood pottery, which was built in Cincinnati. Those were done by Leanne Chellis Wessel. Uh -huh. So the movie theater was my babysitter. Beautiful. And my, my friend and I would go and we would spend the afternoon and then our mothers would come and get us for dinner. And, you know, and then we were at it the next day. Right. Oh, that's just beautiful. There is another spectacular among many in 
in your collection, and the other is the Spencer House, which yes. is just oh. magnificent. This is out uh, of the front of it. Yeah. This this was the point at which Lou said we're we're moving the collection <laughs> because <laughs> that house? that building was in my house and it was in his his favorite map room. But it's an absolutely stunning building and and the history behind it. Um, aside from the fact that Lady Princess Diana was one of my favorite people in the whole world. And so we started out, um, I got a book on Spencer House and had decided that that was one of the buildings I would like to recreate. And I actually um, had purchased the original one from, from um, the library company, Dan McNeil. Okay. And after the plans that we made, he, he suddenly passed away. And so I got in touch with uh, Mulvaney and Rogers and I said, you know, there's this fabulous structure that I have and I would love to make it into, into Spencer House. And they looked at it and, and agreed that it, it should be done. And so we, we took some liberty. I mean, if, if you look at the real Spencer House, they don't have a staircase on the front, uh -huh. but because it was a Palladian style, uh, we were able to add that was on the original structure that I had purchased, but it's, it's just absolutely a stunning work of art. It's, yeah. it's all hand carved and hand painted and the gold gilding there. I think uh, 180 sheets of gold gilt was used on the columns and ceilings and every, every place that we have the gold gilt. So was it a collaborative effort? There are other artisans that have contributed, right? Uh, yes, uh, Kevin and Susie actually made the building and they made um, several pieces of furniture in there, um, but most of the pieces were commissioned. Uh, the oil paintings were all commissioned. Uh, what we tried to do on the top floor was to gather together all of the, the Spencer, um, you know, starting with the first Earl Spencer who built this house for his wife. Uh, starting with first Earl and going all the way up to the ninth Earl Spencer, which was Lady Diana's brother, Princess Diana's brother, Charles. And are they, are the rooms reproductions of the real rooms? Yes, they are. Yeah. Um, the, well. the layout is a little different because the, the real Spencer house is only two stories. Oh. So um, there again, you know, we had to do, take a little bit of license and, um, the rooms that you see here are the rooms that are actually open to the public. Wow. They're open um, every Sunday. Um, I think they're closed two months, uh, August and, and January, but this is the buff ante room. And just uh, when you walk into the real Spencer house, I, I can't even explain what it's like because I, I really feel like I'm walking into my miniature. Yeah. It's everything is so exact. Uh, we had to we had to be careful with copyright issues. So um, a lot of the things that you see there, as, especially the painting to the left on the wall, uh, Leslie Smith painted that. And rather than painting the real Spencer House with the old world old world look, we had to, you know, we had to make it look the way it looks now with the staircase on the front. So. It's, it, but it's, that's exactly when you walk in, that's, that's pretty much what you see. And I could see you decorated for the holidays. Is this what it looks like when you, when you, when, during the yes. holidays, you go yes. and decorate? Yes. It's stunning. It's Thank just you. stunning. And, Thank you. and the chandeliers are beautiful, each one of them. Again, they're repros. Yes, those, everything in here is a reproduction of what was there originally. Um, during the first, during the Second World War, the Rothschild group moved everything out of Spencer House and took it to Althrop in, um, you know, where, where the estate was. And when the Rothschild group decided that they wanted to refurbish it and put it back the way it was when the first Earl Spencer built it for his wife, they asked, it was then the eighth Earl Spencer, if they could incorporate, you know, take the things back and put them in that, that had been removed. And he had already put them in outbuildings. So actually what you see here is a reproduction of a reproduction. Wow. So it's, but it's everything, everything is exactly, if you walk in, if you walk through Spencer House, 
you would see the, the three sculptures on the, the mantelpiece. And when I go through there, I actually, I'll go through and I'll say, wait a minute, you all moved something. You moved, <laughs> you moved this into another room. It needs to go back where it was. I love it. But the instruments that you see there are by Foster Tracy and they're all workable. They're all functional. You can tune them and play them. Oh my gosh. And how long did this take from start to finish? I believe that it was commissioned in 2001 and they delivered it in November of 2004. So three years. So it took, it took quite a while. Oh my goodness. But, it's just really, really stunning. But what I think is so interesting about your collection is it's, it's diversity. So you go from this awesome, you know, palace basically mm -hmm. to classic American architecture, right? With the Polar right. House? Yes. This, this is Paul Revere's house in uh, Boston. Paul Revere had 13 children. Okay. And I think for, it, it's actually quite a large house. Yeah, you only see one oh. part of it here. I'm sorry? Yeah, you, you, we only get to see one part of it here. I wish I had right. a little bit, but yeah. Right. It must be... So he raised 13 children in that home. And since the foundry, you know, he, he did uh, copper and brass, and silver he was a silversmith and because the foundry was actually located in another place what i wanted to do with this house was to incorporate that foundry because that was you know that was the real basis of his work so one of the rooms does have um his tools set up it's it's actually around the the corner there where the where the red hutch is and um so it's where he's melting the silver and he's pouring them into forms you know, to create, and, and I've even got, I've even got the silver blocks that, that are put into the, the pots to be melted. Yeah, I mean, this is just a stunning reproduction of, I mean, again, this is a reproduction that, that, that from, from his home? Yes, yes, if you go through, now, here again, this is another, this is a Pam Troop uh, structure, and she went to Boston and actually, uh, measured every inch of it. So what you see from Paul Revere, lots, lots of times she'll have to improvise, you know, if uh, she'll have to put doorways on different walls or whatever. But in this particular house, it's exactly the way it's, it is in real life. So, so, uh, so the rooms actually, you can't see every room from every angle. Is that what we're saying? Like, no, and, well, and it's like, a, that was the beauty of her houses is that one room led into another you know, and you have staircases and you have things like that, that, you know, yeah. it's not like a regular, what we would call a dollhouse that is just one room deep. Right. And we're going to get to Pat and Noel Thomas, but they were known for that as well as is, is, is really historic, ac yes. architecturally yes. accurate, which is just fascinating. So, so. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Oh, there's the foundry. That's the foundry. Oh, okay. There you go. There's the foundry. Yeah. There you go. I, there you go. I mean, it, it just, it's just the level of detail is crazy. You and is there a specific that. reason that you were drawn to do this as a project? Well, I was, I was blessed enough to be contacted by uh, a man in Hawaii who had a house of, of Pam's and he was, selling, he was selling the miniatures out of the house, but said that he couldn't sell the house because it was too heavy and he didn't want to ship it. So I got in touch with him and I said, I, you're, you're taking the, the pieces out of the house to sell separately. But if, an, if a museum were to, to look, they would want the whole, whole thing, the whole entire thing. And so I was, I was lucky enough to be able to get several of the pieces out of uh, one of the houses that, that, he was, that he was selling. And because I had another house of hers that I wanted to furnish. So as it turned out, long story short, when I contacted him, I said, you know, I don't know if you have any other houses that she did, but these need to be in a museum. And it turned out he had two new, two other ones. He wow. had the Paul Revere house and he had the, the uh, Davidson shop, which was an apothecary shop in Williamsburg, Virginia. Wow. So I was able to get those. I was able to get the, the two. Uh, he had another actually cousin houses, Folly Lane and Folly Cove. And one, one was for, the cousin in England and the other one was for the cousin in New England. They were both sea captains. So I have five of her pieces now and they are just, they're, I mean, they're just incredible. 
They're amazing. All right, I want to take a second to take a question from the chat box. And, and remember, folks, please um, ask us some questions if you have any. Um, put it in the chat box or the Q&A. Um, so we have a question. Do you have a favorite period of architecture and furniture? You know, I, I don't. And I think that's the beauty of having the museum because you like it all. I really live in all of these houses. Yeah. And, you know, I have, I have my home, which I live in. And it's, um, if I want a Spanish style house, you know, I can, I can go, I can, I can walk around the museum. I can go inside and, and live in it. I, you know, I have every, I've got Tudor. I have, I have Southwest. I have Victorian, several Victorians. Um, and it, it's just really fun. I do not have a favorite uh, period of architecture. I, I think Savage Manor is, is probably one that I, I, this is a room from Savage Manor right here. It's down in the, in the kitchen area. And I think um, because when it was, when it was built by, by Susie and Kevin, the only design that they had to go on was the gatehouse. Mm -hmm. And it, it was very similar in style to what you see in Amsterdam that the roof line with, you know, with the brickwork. Yeah. And I, I, I think that's probably one of my most favorites. All right, okay. Yeah, it's hard to pick a, it's hard to pick a favorite, I bet, when you have just, you know, there's just so much yeah. to choose from. Is this, this is back to Paul Revere, right? Yeah, this is back to Paul Revere. And if you can imagine, parents and all the children, 13 children, there was, there's another bedroom next door. But if you can imagine the baby, you know, the youngsters, the, the, the parents, everybody's sleeping in a, well, I, I didn't put 13 beds in there, but, but as you can see, I mean, it's, you just sort of have to, have to visualize what it must have been like. Oh, I can't imagine. I want people to notice, is that a wig on the credenza? In it, the is. it is. It is I, a wig. Like a classic lawyer's wig from that era, I guess? Exactly. Wow. I, think it, I think it was his father's. Oh. No, his father's probably would have fallen apart by then. I don't know. But I just thought it was a nice touch. <laughs> no, I love it. I love it. And you can actually see it through the doorway in this photo. Yes. yes. And that's that's the second bedroom. Uh, I, I love the colors that are used. They're very, I mean, it's perfectly accurate to his history. And I, I, for, I love the photography. Your photography is fantastic for the way you shoot your, your miniatures. You see the feather there. You know, you really don't know scale unless you see something like that in the exactly. shot. It just, exactly. That blows. I'm very blessed. I'm very blessed to have a wonderful photographer. And so it's, I mean, she really does make these things come alive. It, it's, it's almost as if you are in the room. That's right. You totally feel that. Absolutely. I want to take mm -hmm. another question. Mm, this is a good question from Dale. What are the challenges of transporting the exhibits with so many fragile components? Well, <clears throat> At this point, they've only been moved once, and that was from my home down to the museum. And I can tell you it was extremely challenging, especially with Spencer House. Uh, uh, in fact, the people who were here helping had to take me out to lunch because I, I really, <laughs> I couldn't watch. But Bill Robertson devised a, a nine foot sled. Oh. <laughs> and, and the room that, that Spencer House was in had to go down two, two brick stairs oh. and then onto the yard and then it had to go through a portico, go up, a, up one stairs uh, and then into the truck. And so Spencer House wasn't that long. There was, there was a lot of space and they put it in the middle and they started pulling it. And it very, very smoothly went down over the two steps, over the grass, up into the portico and then up onto the truck mm -hmm. and honestly it was genius it was genius the way but you know anytime anytime we move it's uh it's a challenge because we don't want anything these all these pieces are so, are so precious that yep. we don't want to break anything or or whatever so we're very careful yeah yeah I can imagine. yeah it's, it's about reducing the number of times you actually touch them because yes more times you touch them, the greater chances that something happens to them. No matter exactly. how well made they are. It exactly. Happens. It happens. Because, yeah, I mean, I think only the artist knows really how to, how to handle that, that miniature. Because they yeah. built it. And they know the pressure points. They know where they can and cannot hold it. 
Well, it's interesting. My photographer, Ken McKisson, has learned when she takes things out to photograph them, she's got a touch. And I'm, I'm very blessed that way. Yeah. So we try to open the cases as few times as possible. As few times as possible. I hear you. All right. So let's get, now these are, Pat and Old Thomas are probably one of my favorite miniaturists and mm -hmm. in, in, inspiration for me when I was growing up. Beautiful. So this is the Whittier, right? Yes. This is the Whittier. Uh, it was actually the home of Sarah Salisbury, who was a big miniatures collector. And this was her childhood home. So she had Noel and Pat uh, build it. And it's, it's a California mission style house. And it's filled with all kinds of wonderful arts and crafts pieces. Can you talk a little bit about Pat and Noel Thomas? Because I think they are some of the most well-known, as, as well as Mulvaney and Rogers. Talk, talk a little bit about them. Have you met them? I yes. Uh, yes, I've met Pat and Noel. Not, well, I met them first at the Guild School. Oh. but uh, the International Guild of Miniature Ars Artisans. And uh, I took their classes and I was, I was really uh, taken with their, their uh, process of aging. And that's what they're most known for is the aging of their houses. And um, I know when, when I purchased South Bend, I actually got it from Sarah Salisbury's collection through Nolan Pat. Right. And when, when it got there, we were, we had, we had put it on its case on the base and we were set about to clean it. And we, you know, we had little brushes and we were cleaning the dust off and Bill Robertson came over and said, don't, don't do that. Don't touch it. It's supposed to be there. <laughs> so, so that's, you know, that's how far it goes. I but you know, on the outside, they, they do cracks in the sidewalk and they do, you know, mold and algae and, it's, it's just phenomenal the way they, they, they finish up the houses to look like they're really, really lived in. And so this is one of the rooms in the interior. Yes. And this is the library and living room. Um, we have furniture here by Mark Murphy mm -hmm. and, um, and uh, um, uh, Kari Bloom. Okay. And then the pottery, uh, a good bit of it is by Leanne Chellis Wessel. She's awesome. And the stained glass is awesome too. It's beautiful. Yes. I mean, there's just so much. And the leather chair in the back is probably one of the Yes. Fantastic. Yes. Yeah. And the color here, here's the example of the cracks in this in the in the sidewalk that you were talking about. And yes. also the weathering techniques, yes. which are pretty stunning. Exactly. This this actually was taken right before I furnished it. So wow. if if we see it when it's in the museum, it actually is filled with china, the most beautiful wow. uh, porcelain china, you know, place settings. So it's, and it's so much, you know, everything that I do, I do as if it's a real house. And I want to have everything in there that, that would make it feel like a real home. So um, that's one of the things that I'm, I'm actually blessed to have all of the little knickknacks and, and everything to go in it to, to make it feel like you're right there. So what is your process for actually furnishing? I mean, do you do the research? Are you like, what do you do first? What, how do you decide what to get, where to get it? What, what I actually do when I'm getting ready to furnish a house is if I'm on a mission and I, and I know that, that I need to pick something arts and crafts, I, I would go to that person. But I don't purchase anything unless it really connects with my heart. I, I have to have a heart connection. <laughs> and when, when I see something and I know that it's for me, I will find a place for it. Uh, right, right. So that's, yeah. that's, that's, pretty much the way, that's pretty much the way I collect. I, I go in uh, with what, what I have in mind and um, just keep looking until I find the right thing. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's um, that's a common that's common theme amongst people who love miniatures is that there is an emotional connection to that tiny object for whatever reason. Yes, it's back to our and, childhood, or you know, the the other thing that to me that really touches me is that I know all of these artisans make what they like to make. Right. In fact, they love they love what they make, and when I go to their booth or I contact them about a piece, I say, I buy these pieces because I love what you make. Right. And so that it, it's like there's a connection between the artisan and myself 
through the pieces they make. And I think that's, I think it's really important yeah. to have that connection. Yeah, I agree. I mean, it's one thing to have a connection with another person who enjoys miniatures. Then, you know, mm -hmm. there's another layer and level above, of, you know, of that, which is you're connecting the artist with the collector. Yes. You know, there is that, yeah. there's connection there. So talk a little bit about that be, as being, you know, being a collector, what, what kind of advice would you give to someone who's out there who might want to be, you know, start collecting? Where would one start? How do you look for that thing that touches your heart? I don't know. What, what would you say? Well, I think, I think with this beautiful, I, I, I hesitate to even call it a hobby, but I mean, that's what it is. What you have to, what you have to do first is save your money because this is not, this is not an inexpensive hobby. And, and, and to make sure that when you, when you are at shows or, you know, talking with, with the artisans that you're discerning about what you get, you know, look at it. I, my, my standard is, could I blow it up and use it in my own home? Right. Well, is the detail, is it that detailed? Is it that perfect? Yeah. You know, and, and I also look at the way things are made. I, I tend to stick with um, pieces of furniture and silver that are all made in the same, in the same technique as the original was made. Right. And so I, I just, you have to have a discerning eye and, and buy what you love. Right. Right. No, that's really good advice. I love the, the visual of if that can fit, if that will work in my house, can I sit on that chair? <laughs> it, that's right. Size? Does it have traditional joinery so it can hold me? <laughs> exactly. But exactly. That's, that's a great way to look at it. Well, let's take another question from the chat box. Ah, I'm wondering about the drawers and cabinets. Do they open? Everything, everything opens. That's from a I, I do, I do not purchase anything that doesn't move. If it has drawers, the drawers have to open. And in fact, I go so far as to say the drawers have to have dovetails or that it has to be mortar tenon. It has to be pegged. It has to be, you know, however the original was made. Yeah. yeah. I, I think if, if one would come to the museum, you would find that all the clocks work, all of the silver has to be polished and the brass, all of the light bulbs have to be changed. And so this is no different than taking care of your own home. Right, right, if not more, more so. All right, Everything well, more Carlos's question, which was, are the metals actually metal? Yes, and the silver is actually real silver, and yes. the drawers actually function. Wow, yes. all right, that's fantastic. All right, let's see, we have one more question. I mean, do you have a favorite piece in your collection? I don't know if that could be answered. You know, I, every piece is a favorite piece of mine and each one is like my baby. Yeah. If something happens, I don't care if it's, a, if it's a, a blotter on a desk. If I lose that blotter or something happens to it, I feel like I've lost a part of me. Yeah, right. So I, I, I think when I, when I go through the gallery, I try to pretend that I'm a visitor Mm. And every time I go to a case, I look and I, I, I really study each one of the pieces. And I, 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 to this day, I do not ever stop being amazed at the, at the workmanship yeah. or the artistry that's produced by these artisans. It, it's just, I'll bet. it's amazing. So they're all my favorites. Oh, that's a good answer. I like that. I think we touched a little bit upon this, but in the Spencer house, were the paintings all hand painted? Yes. All hand painted. They yeah. were all hand painted and they actually, um, there was a Russian artist uh, by the name of Dmitry. I, I can't pronounce his last name too well, but uh, he did all of the, the uh, Spencers, all the, the ones in the, in the, in the uh, great room, which is the music room or the, the portrait gallery and Leslie Smith did the three Benjamin West paintings that are over the mantelpiece. So yes, they are, they are all oils. And, and actually yeah. they are, they're the ones that are in Spencer house that are on loan from the queen. Oh my goodness. So, so these are, these are replicas. One more question about the Spencer house. Um, has the Spencer family ever seen the house? I'm sure they have. Um, and I'm sure they have because they have um, 
whatever, whatever they have set up as far as entertaining, it can be rented out 65 times a year okay. for parties. And I'm sure that they've attended. I'm sure that they, you know, I'm sure that they're in there uh, periodically. Uh, right. But uh, it actually, the Rothschild family took a 125 year lease on it um, almost 125 years ago. So it's, it's about to come up again. Right. All right. Let's wait. I, I want to go back because I don't want to go what's next. Can, there was a question that I, I'd gotten um, about how your collection has evolved over the years. Has there, have there been changes in how you look at the collection, how you build it? Yes, absolutely. When I started out, um, you know, I started out with basic country furniture and, you know, I went from there to uh, uh, buying from the singing tree in England, which were, you know, English, English furniture. So I've, I've sort of graduated up and, and I had, I had told myself that I really was not a gold gilt person, that I, that I didn't really want to collect gold furniture. Right. Uh -huh. But when Spencer House, when, when the opportunity for Spencer House came and I, I looked through the rooms in the book and it was a wonderful combination of really warm libraries and, and just a very, had a very welcoming atmosphere to it. And so I thought, you know, this, this is a good combination of, of something that looks lived in, something that, that ordinary people could come in and sit down in the, in the library and read books and, you know, and then you go through the formal rooms that have the gold in them. And so that was, that was the turning point for me as far as being able to progress to the, the more formal European and French, you know, furniture. So you started more with more casual, would you say? Yes. Yeah. And now it's quite opulent. Exactly. So what, so what might be next for you in terms of, what 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 would you love to see made in miniature? Even if you're, you know, not I, I I'm not sure that there isn't. There are so many things already made in miniature, right. and I look and and when I see them, I think, you know, okay, that's already been done. It's already been done. There isn't anything you can't find in miniature, and I have pretty much, um, as far as the collection goes what our plans are is to are, are to get these miniatures back out again into the changing exhibit gallery and so that we can show the whole collection all at one time wow. so i'm working on I'm, I'm finishing up projects there and i have not commissioned anything new um, because i'm just i'm so pleased with everything that i have it and it runs the gamut i mean it's just totally across the board um so Nothing really new in the making. Right. But always something happening. Always like, something happening. Always something happening. So there yeah. is a book. You have created this book, and that's available for people, right, to find? How, how can they find it? Well, they can go on my website, which is ksbminiaturescollection.com. And I, actually, this is the second volume. I, I did the first volume. Uh, volume one of Collectively Speaking, and then we did oh. the second. We did the second book, so there are two books available. Right, awesome. And so you also do tours and speaking speaking engagements. Is that right? I know yes, I do. it might be really hard, but, but people can find you and and follow you. Yes, and see they can follow me, they can follow me on the website. There, there's a how to basically to you know to find out how to get in touch with me. Uh, I do presentations for different uh, groups, and um, of course, I give tours in the museum, which is, is always fun. So, what, like, what are your thoughts around the miniatures world these days? Because what I'm finding is there is a resurgence in interest. Um, there is a lot of activity around miniatures on social media, in particular. Um, yes. The, my observation at the shows has been that they are growing in attendance. Yes. And there are makers coming out from everywhere, which is great. So, so are you seeing similar things and what are your thoughts around the industry? I, I am. I am. I'm, I think during this pandemic, I've been absolutely amazed at the miniature artisans who have been able to sell their things online. And it, it has never 
ceased. I mean, everybody I talk to, they say, I'm still buying. And, and that's, yeah. it, I think for, for people who, you know, who are going through this, this time yeah. to have the income to buy that and, and make that their first choice. Right. You know, it's the first choice of, of what they want to spend their money on. Right. And I, I just think it's, I, th I think the future in miniatures is growing. Um, all of the people from, from the European countries, from South Africa, from, uh, you know, the Middle East, Far yeah. East, everywhere. We've well, got new artisans coming on the scene all the time. So, you know, there's a, the question of whether or not you have to actually see a miniature before you purchase a miniature. Would you purchase a miniature without having seen it and felt it? And have you, or do you? I have, and if, if it is a piece by artisans that are deceased, oh. or an artisan that I'm trying to fill in the collection, I, I know the quality of work and I can, I can buy it without feeling it. If I see a photograph of it, I know, you know pretty much you know. Uh, what I'm gonna get. But for the most part, I really do. I like to see, I like to touch and, and know, and, and look, because you really have to, go over it with a fine tooth comb to make sure that, that it's museum quality. Right, right. Um, so that was that. So what is your, what's your viewpoint um, on, because we're seeing a lot of new techniques and tools and technologies like 3D, mm -hmm. laser print. Where's your head at in terms of whether or not you will accept a piece that's been made some other way? <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting. I, my my uh, perspective about that has evolved as well mm -hmm. because three years ago i was not for 3d i'm i'm all about handmade realis realism you know and yeah. and for me that's that's where i i get i get a real kick out of out of seeing the the miniature size of a full full size piece right but paris renfro made a a Manhattan penthouse for me, which I, I absolutely adore it. If I could live in New York City, that's exactly where I would live. And and he introduced me to 3D. Is that right? So lo and behold, I had a 3D uh, figure made of, actually Lou and I had one made together, but then I had one made to put in, in the penthouse because I have a, a full wall of John Almeida's beautiful pottery. Right. Yeah. Uh, and so I'm, I'm actually standing there in a pose and I'm looking up at all of this, all this gorgeous pottery, just yeah. trying to figure out which one is my favorite. So yes, there is a place for 3D. All right, good. That's good to hear. I mean, I think at the end of the day, it's, you know, it's not one thing that attracts us to that tiny treasure. You know, right. it's not one thing that tugs at our heartstrings. It's not right. one thing, how it's made, how it looks, what the colors are, what it is. So, you know, I, I, I'm, I've evolved too. I was like, no, no, no 3D, no laser. <laughs> but you can still have this beautiful object. And yes. okay, it was made in different ways, but it makes you feel really good. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. That's what it's about. So let's, um, let's take one more question or two from the chat bar. Um, oh, nice compliment on the book. It's a wonderful book. I bought it. That's lovely. Oh, thank you. That. The museum is amazing. If you don't visit, you are really missing awesome miniatures. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you so much. Got the book from you at Igma. All right, <laughs> that's awesome. Oh, uh, I think, oh, 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 yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, let's see. Ah, hmm, this is a good question. Um, do, <laughs> What is, what's a typical day for you? I mean, are you literally walking through the museum? You know, I, I'm, I'm down at the museum as much as I can be. Um, I like to keep the cases. I like to make sure that the cases are in pristine order. And I like to make sure that the, the paintings haven't fallen off the wall or, you know, we, we, um, we're, because we're on the Ohio River and when the, the boats go up and down, they have a tendency to vibrate. And so things have a tendency to walk sometimes. We, we, we actually have special floors in there to make sure that they don't. But um, I, I really, I like to make sure that everything is in, is in great order for our visitors when they come, that all the lights are on, all the, all the, all the chandeliers are shining brightly and everything's dusted. And so, you know, I get up and I, I also play. I, I have miniatures up here at the house that, 
that I look at and try to figure out how I'm going to come up with different vignettes and different ways to use them. So great. That's awesome. So I sort of, I, I, I eat and, and breathe miniatures. I get it. <laughs> so yeah. the museum, is it, is it open yet or is what's, what's happening with it? The museum opened, uh, it's been open for about a month, I believe. Okay. All right. And uh, it, it's open every day, but Sunday and Monday from 10 until 3.30. Great. So awesome. we would love for everybody to come visit and you've got to come. I know I have to come there. And I love that you, um, you've connected to the Chicago show, which makes it easier for folks mm -hmm. who are visiting Chicago to just scoot down and come visit the museum. That's exactly. really great. Yeah. I love it. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, that's, I mean, I think this has been so great. Kay, thank you so much for joining us today. And I have to say thank you to you for what you're doing for the miniatures world. It's my pleasure. It's, it's an awesome. art form and it, People need to know about it. I thank agree. you. I agree. And I thank you for bringing the art form to people and having this museum and creating this beautiful collection and scoping out the best miniatures in the world. So <laughs> thank, so you. Good. thank you. It's been a joy. What's that? It's been a joy. And we, you know, this is not, there's so much more we could talk about. We could do this for days. So we would love to have you back. I maybe, would love to come back. Yeah. Maybe we could see your Christmas collection later on this year. And how awesome would that be? That would be fabulous. All right. Well, thank you again. It's been thank awesome. You. Have ah. a good rest of the day. And thank, thank you, everybody you. else, for joining us. It's been thank great. Thank you. All right. Be good, everybody. Enjoy. We'll see you. Bye.